Bill Orem covers the Lakers for the Athletic. He's been a busy guy. Um, if somebody didn't see the game last night, how would you describe how the Lakers played? Well, I think at the end of the game, I tweeted that it was a dreadful result. And, you know, it's it, it's it's really an accumulation of a lot of things. The Pacers aren't very good. They've lost 10 of their last 11 games. The Lakers had a 15-point lead in the first quarter. They got 30 points from LeBron James. And, you know, I'd say Russell Westbrook wasn't doing the things that we usually think of as being bad Russ things. Turn, he only had one turnover. He shot four of six from three. But he still ended up having a terrible night from the field. He was not finishing around the rim. And he ends the night on the bench, something we haven't seen this year with Frank Vogel, who's kind of, you know, really coaching for his job, as we reported earlier this week on kind of a night to night basis, you know, throwing the kitchen sink at the Pacers, which in this case was not playing the, the highest, the, you know, the $44 million guy. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to understand if this is fixable, Bill, because it feels like, OK, get rid of the coach. That doesn't fix effort. And a, and a lot of what I saw or what I see on defensively is there's no effort. Uh, so how do you fix this? Can you fix this this season? Yeah, I mean, that's I think that's what the, the front office is weighing. You know, what do you sacrifice this season in the name of you know pursuing a championship when that might already be lost with this team? And, and you know, you do see coaching changes sort of shake up a, a team psyche, give them a kickstart, you know, a kick in the butt, whatever. Um, but we've also seen the Lakers uh, play for David Fisdale this year. They went one and four with him when, when Frank Vogel had COVID. And that's maybe an unfair uh, way of judging David Fisdale as a potential replacement, given all that all that was going on with replacement players. But I do think the Lakers sort of got a, a glimpse of what that might look like. And if they weren't, you know, um, you know, if they weren't really excited about that, you know, maybe that gives them pause on making a change. And, you know, last the last uh, previous two years, Jason Kidd was on the bench and that was somebody the Lakers held in really high regard. Somebody who, um, if not for some of the baggage, might have been a candidate for the head coaching job in, in 2019. Um, instead, he kind of comes to the Lakers and rehabs his image. He would have been a likely he would have been a really obvious replacement if there was a midseason firing while he was on the bench. It's less obvious now. Uh, with David Fisdale um, and, and and Phil Handy and Mike Penberthy as the lead assistants, so it's really what what do you want to sacrifice this year in the pursuit of something uh, short term? When you know I don't like 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 you, Dan. You know this doesn't seem like something that is just going to um, is going to change with a new voice. What can they do at the trade deadline? Very limited, right? I mean, they have, you know, basically three tradable pieces. When you look at, um, you know, Taylor Horton Tucker, who makes $10 million, Kendrick Nunn makes $5 million. And then they have a first round pick way out in 2027 when, you know, hopefully I'm going to be on a, on a rowboat fishing for bass somewhere uh, by then. But, um, but, you know, and then, and then, yeah, okay, maybe you've got some second round picks. We know they were interested in Cam Reddish from the Hawks before he went to the Knicks and they were throwing around a couple of second rounders. They have the the minimum contracts. I mean, here's one thing the Lakers have an abundance of. It's a bunch. It's a, it's it's minimum contracts that are totally disposable because they signed so many guys in the offseason who are not playing and are not contributing. So if they needed to get you know up to five million dollars or seven million dollars on, on contracts and then throw in second round picks as sweeteners, you could trade Kent Bazemore, DeAndre Jordan, Wayne Ellington because those guys aren't contributing right now in the near term. But again, if we're talking about THT. Kendrick Nunn, and then that first down the road, what are you getting back that is actually going to make it um, make it worth it? Because Taylor Horton Tucker, with only a year and a half left on his contract, has more value to the Lakers than anyone else. They're the ones that you know found him, developed him, have some confidence in him, um, have the relationship. I don't know that anybody else values him as highly as the Lakers do, and especially as a $10 million a year player. So it's going to be really hard to, to find an impact player at the deadline for the Lakers. Anybody interested in Russell Westbrook? Um, you know, there's there's always a chance. Uh, you know, one thing I think we've learned in the NBA is that there's there is no such thing as an untradeable contract. <laughs> but I do think that we are getting very close to the stage where Russ is an untradeable player. Um, the contract on top of the way he plays, the way he changes your system, the way everything becomes about Russ and and sort of the, the diminishing returns we've seen with him as a player, I think makes him, you know, really, really difficult to move. And, you know, that's kind of why a lot of people were were so caught so off guard by the Lakers uh, making that investment in the offseason, that it was um, a really big swing, but also a really big risk. And when you take that risk, 
you don't have other cards to play. You have you have expended your bank account. It's like going all in on 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 your you know on your sixteen year old's uh, lemonade stand and realizing nobody's thirsty. It just doesn't. It 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 hasn't paid off yet. And you know the Lakers don't have you know that next move. Well, okay, if that doesn't work, then how do you adjust? And they don't have that next card to play. So is anyone interested in Russell Westbrook? You know the Lakers don't have the sweeteners to come off of his contract. They don't have the you know, the 2022 first and the 2024 first that, you know, a team might want. They don't have, you know, young, I mean, honestly, the Lakers best trade sweetener right now is probably Austin Reeves, who is their undrafted rookie who is playing really meaningful minutes and has become this real bright spot. You know, if I'm, if I'm a team trying to trade with the Lakers, you know, I'm not just asking for, you know, all the, all the guys who aren't playing who I described earlier. I would also want a guy who can come in and contribute in Austin Reeves and I, I don't know that the Lakers are going to be able to do that. Why would the Lakers leak this? If you're not going to make a change, like what, what, tell me the game that's played here of getting this information out here. You don't have to tell me who the source is obviously, but you know, they, they wanted this out there. It feels like that fair. Uh, Fair. I prefer to think of it as really good reporting. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it was. I'm sure it is my bad. Uh, So due to the great reporting, this information got out there. Why? Yeah, I think that there's a couple ways of looking at it. Obviously, um, you know, I would I would actually say that Frank Vogel has probably uh, got gotten a boost from the fact that this information has been out there. Not just not to say that that is where you know, I'm not I'm not suggesting you sleuth that that is where the, the information is coming <laughs> from. But it, it you know I do think that you know the organization has taken a little bit of a hit from the fact that this has been that this has been uh, reported in the way it's been framed that. Um, that, you know, that they are looking to make a change. But I think the general reaction is like, like you said, what difference is that going to make and who's going to come in and do a better job? And so I, I think that, um, well, the team didn't even step up last night, Bill. I mean, well, and, that's what was, and that was what was so interesting because we didn't report this until after the jazz game. And there was a lot of pressure, you know, I think there was just a sense of pressure, like a really heavy, you know, the air was really heavy in the crypt uh, on Monday night against the Jazz before the Lakers won that game. But then, um, you know, once it was reported and then there was some follow-up reporting from other outlets kind of on the way the front office was sort of applying pressure on Frank Vogel, you, you, I thought last night was going to be a really interesting measuring stick game to see how the, how the, how the locker room responded. And it, it looked good in the beginning. I would have argued that, you know, that looked like a team that was, you know, playing for their coach. And then it completely disintegrated down the stretch uh, LeBron, you know, LeBron started missing shots down the stretch, wasn't getting enough support. Russ wasn't out there. Um, it seemed really disengaged. There seemed to be a lot of chippiness at the end of the game, a lot of saltiness. So, you know, and it's the timing, Dan is really fascinating because if you were going to make a change, you would have thought it'd be last night because they're about to go on the six game road trip. That is going to be brutal. I mean, they've got Orlando tomorrow night, but then after that it's Miami, Brooklyn, Philly, Charlotte, Atlanta. Those are all teams they could lose to. So, um, the timing's really tough for them. Well, it's only eight thirty local time. The, you know, you got. I was told. I was told last night that Frank Vogel was getting on the plane today. So if as as long as nothing changed between you know midnight last night and you know whenever they're taking off for Orlando, ten a.m. or so, uh, Frank Vogel is going to be coaching the team in Orlando. But it's interesting. I mean, he's on the hot seat. You know, as he as he loses to Indiana and now going to Orlando. You know, for Frank Vogel, I've got to think that's like the ghosts of firings past. So. Um, Sure, he's hoping to make it through just those those uh, those those bad memories. Is he on the plane coming back, Bill? He will be on a plane coming back. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I do think that like I don't want to say that the, that he bought time with the 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 Utah win. I mean, the Utah game was really pivotal. If there had been a, a similar result against the Jazz to what happened two nights earlier against Denver, I think I think the front office would have felt like they had no other choice. But now. Not that the Utah win itself lowered the temperature, but the the fact that they they snapped the streak, they got a win against the top Western Conference team, although a team that lost to the Rockets last night has now lost six to seven. Um, I do think that it's sort of kind of popped the balloon in a sense where the Lakers are willing to kind of ride this out a little bit. But it doesn't mean um, it doesn't mean it can't get worse. I, although I will say uh I always, I always refer to the, the the great Jim Murray's quote, which was, there's nothing so bad it can't be made worse by firing the coach. Bill, thank you. We appreciate your time and uh, have fun on the road trip.
Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate it. That's Bill Orem. Done a great job. Great reporting for The Athletic, of course. Had the, uh, had the story about Frank Vogel coaching for his job. He's getting on the plane this morning.